Hi, Rod. Hi, Rod. Can you hear me? This is Dave, K6VML. I heard you, Dave. Okay. Hey, Rod, you got your ears on? We can't hear you, though. So you still have a mic problems on your side. Hi, Dave. Hi, Rod. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah, I thought. I, I thought when I heard hi Dave, that was a, a delayed um, transmission from Rod, <laughs> but it was it was you, yeah, 
Yeah, I'm not hearing him either. Yeah, I know he was having problems uh, Monday night he's, on the venture. He's, he's got his mic muted. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, he had it unmuted before, and we still couldn't hear him. Hmm. I think there's. I think he's maybe he has an inline uh, mute button too that's activated. Oh yeah. Got my sh second shot tonight, Doc. Say again. Got oh, my second, second one? shot today. Yep. That's great. <clears throat> I'm. I got mine uh, about maybe a month ago. My second one. So <clears throat> it's been wonderful. You're you're really going to enjoy life a lot more in the next week. Yeah. <clears throat> I was looking forward to getting it. When you when you get your full uh, the full effect from the second shot. <clears throat> which which one was it? Pfizer. Yeah. I had Moderna, and my kids have had Moderna, and they've been telling me that they had a lot of pain in their shoulder from <clears throat> the second shot. But aside from that, not, not so bad. <clears throat> you want to give it a try again, Rod? Go ahead, Rod. Uh, still not working. It's not muted, but you have no audio. Maybe mic gain is down or something. No, nope, still can't hear you. No audio. But we, we're all old enough that we can probably read lips pretty well because our hearing has been going for years. <laughs> <coughs> so we're gradually getting used to reading lips. Well, I think I'll mute my mic and uh, go take a couple of Tylenol. <coughs> I've been working on an antenna all day <clears throat> and I got more aches and pains than usual. So I'll try to minimize them with a little anti-inflammatory. Okay, see you in a bit. I renewed my SBARC membership today. I was delinquent since the end of March. So I'm, I'm, I'm legit again. Yeah, I just did mine. If you renew, like since you renewed today, is it good a year from today or a year from March? Probably a year from today, right? Um, I believe a year from today. Yeah. Uh, Zoom doesn't work. Um, Zoom works great on my iPhone, but when I try to use my Android, which is um, 
quite old now. It, when I when I try to send text messages invitations, somehow they don't go out. I don't know why. I haven't figured that out yet. Is it does it still have an active uh, cell account on it? Do you still uh, use it as a cell phone? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It uh, sometimes I answer calls on it with this um, with the uh, app I have installed. Oh, well, if you're using an app, it might be going through the internet. So does it have a cell number attached to it? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I saved the app. It, it was the, the messages app that was, that was uh, preloaded on it. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But I, th I think of all my Zoom um, enabled computers, the iPhone has the best picture and and everything else works on it too. For, mm -hmm. for Yeah, our whole family here is all Apple based too. We're pretty happy with it. Mm -hmm. Not PCs and but, uh, you know, phone end. Uh-huh. Guess I ought to turn that radio off in the other room.
Hey, Brian. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. Hi, Brian. How you doing, Doc? You were moving a little slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, uh, it's good news and bad news. <clears throat> I ordered a high gain vertical because I finally got permission from the mobile home park to put up a, an antenna for emergency communication. And so I thought I'd, uh, and I'm, I already have an indoor antenna that works fine on VHF, UHF. So I, I uh, thought I'd put up an HF antenna. <coughs> I ordered a high gain <coughs> vertical uh, at the number is I think a, AV 680, which is uh, an eight band vertical that covers everything from six meters to 80 meters. And I ordered it in November, and then every month they kept telling me, sorry, we don't have any tubing. Our manufacturers cannot tell us when they will supply us with it. And so basically call next month. So I've been calling next month for six months and uh, or more. And two days ago, there it was on my front porch. I had called and they said call back in June, but uh, Apparently they got some tubing and all of a sudden I had a, a vertical in a box on my front porch. So the last couple of days I've been gathering the tools together and setting up a workstation outside of my <clears throat> carport. Today I got the thing partly assembled and put up on the mask that I had installed months ago. So with, it shouldn't be too long. I, I, I figured it might take me two, three months to build it. Because it's got a million little parts, you know. And I, I think I'll get a a, a, a a big blue tarpaulin. I think I might have one in my work, in my shop, in my uh, storage area. <clears throat> Spread it out on the gravel so I don't lose all the small parts when I drop them. <coughs> but <clears throat> I have the, the basic skeleton of the thing completed in basically two days of working on it. So it may not be more than a month before I will operate. It's a vertical? Yeah, it's a, a eight band vertical, uh, takes a kilowatt and a half and it, uh, it, it's broadly tuned. I think you could probably get most of each of the bands, but you probably have to optimize it to whatever, whether you, if you prefer CW to get down at one end and, voice up at the other end. But uh, it's radiates equally poorly in all directions. So it should be it's just sure going to be better than no antenna, which is what I've had. I've got a beautiful station and no place to put the signal. So you have to run radials with that doc? Pardon? Do you have to run radials with that antenna? Uh, no, I bought one that doesn't require radials. Probably means that it's not quite as effective as if it had radials. But uh, they say that you don't lose too much, and it has, uh, you know, about a six-foot radial uh, rods at at the bottom, and at the, at four-foot ones up at the top for 80 meters for a capacitance top hat. It keeps it down to about 26 feet. And the amount at eight feet above the ground, at least eight feet above the ground, when mine is eight feet. <clears throat> so it should work. It should work where it is. And I managed to find it. I thought I'd lost my antenna scope. I had an old AEA antenna scope that graphic shows the, the graph of the SWR curve, you know. Just plug it into the coax and tell it where to go, and it'll graph the uh, SWR curve and show you where the dip is and and you can move you can tune your antenna with that prune stuff a little bit so i'm thinking it'll probably work okay um, it's not going to be as good as any previous antenna i've had on a tower but if you have nothing to compare nothing else to compare it with it you know it seems fine so <clears throat>
Nice. I'm interested to hear how well it performs when you, once you get it up and running. I, I'll, I'll let everybody know if it works well, I'll be bragging. If it's, if you don't hear anything, it means it doesn't work very well. I'm not keeping mom about it. Could cover my embarrassment. No, I, I, I would tell you if it doesn't work. So. But I, I had a, the last antenna I had was a, a DB 11. I think it was a, I, a, a, uh, three element stepper antenna that all the little stepper motors tuned each element to exactly the right length for the frequency you were using. And so it optimized uh, the power transfer out to the antenna and out of the antenna. And it was gorgeous, expensive, but gorgeous. Worked beautifully until it didn't. And then when it stops working, you need to have a whole team of engineers in your home for about six months to, to figure out what's wrong and fix it because sending stuff off to get it fixed and having it come you know it takes months I, for for six months i tried to get it to work when i finally gave up and gave it away i i took it down and donated it before i left arizona and when we opened up the case one of the stepper motor uh, housing units um, had had eaten the, the uh, eaten the antenna. It, it's a long strip of copper. Uh, kind of kind of like a uh, a tape, you know, a measuring tape. And it, and it's but it's got sprocket a sprocket wheel that drives it out and brings it back to tune it to the exactly right length. And one of the, the one of the sides has had slipped off the sprockets and it just ground it all up and you know so we were never able to figure out what it was without taking it down from the tower and disassembling it which like there were 66 screws just to take that one uh, electronic housing uh, stepper motor unit off. <coughs> But I sent it. I sent it back to the factory, and they they either repaired it or gave me gave a new one. To, and then then I when I got it back, I donated it to the uh, to the university club radio at ASU. Very cool. I think I'm, somebody's uh, mic is open, and I'm listening. I, I was confused. It's confusing to the brain. To hear your voice coming back with about a two minute delay on it. Well, I, sent it I sent it back to the factory and they, they either repaired it or they gave, me, they gave a new one. To, and then when I got it back, I donated it. Uh, Somebody's got their um, YouTube op window open. Yes. I think it's you, Doc. No, I don't have it open. You don't? Huh. I'll, I'll mute and you can. It's open and I'm listening. You're right. Where is everybody? <laughs> you even you even had us come like half an hour early, and we're still not all here. Well, we open it at, at seven, so people can check in. Oh. I think it's you, Doc. <coughs> Yeah, somebody yeah. has YouTube open. I just because now it's just catching up. Yeah, maybe mute everybody, Brian. Right. Okay. Well, it stopped. Or we were quiet. I think we were the quiet in that quiet. moment. <laughs> Joe. Joe, yeah. Well, let's give people a couple more minutes. Here's another one. Let's see.
I know it's a nice Friday night. Who wants to waste it on Zoom, right? Yep. Mm. Hi, Marina. Hi. Nice view you got there. Ah, yes, thank you. Just sitting up here on TV Hill where it's nice and safe. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got your hot dogs outside we're roasting? <laughs> oh yeah. Exactly. On the on the on the barbecue. Uh I won't make any more some more jokes. On anyway. the side of the hill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a huge scar from over here. You can really see it. It looks like the uh I mean it looks like it went to dirt in no time. You know, I can't even remember. I've lived here for 65 years and I can't remember that hill ever really burning very much. A couple little fires here and there, but um, there's a lot of old growth there. How far away is that from the um, the ham radio equipment and stuff? Oh, uh, well, Our... it's another hill over kind of. Yeah, a lot would have to burn because mm -hmm. there's just so, you know, it's so densely populated there right i wonder it was wondering making hoping everything stayed safe <clears throat> i have I, I have a background picture that i got for john is he going to be in front of it <laughs> no i just you know he's always talking about going up to the range so i i was just uh, took a picture last time I was at the range, and I thought I'd let him. See. Is that you there, Doc? Say again. Is that you in the photo? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and then we. Uh, it was actually we used to. We it was an eighty-five foot uh, high-speed patrol boat. <clears throat> it looked like a, a PT boat, except no torpedoes. But we did have. Two thirty caliber machine guns on the bow, and one fifty on the on the stern. So, uh, and and we one of the things we did was to uh, support the annual SWAT team competition uh, that was hosted by Alameda County Sheriff's Office. So this is one of the SWAT teams from back east somewhere that we were taken out to board a a um, simulated uh, uh, a boat that a uh, ferry boat that had been taken over by terrorists that kind of thing Levi what are you doing with your uh... <laughs> I, I my webcam came with this program that lets you kind of like video mix so I was just playing yeah. with it I didn't know you could do it in zoom until now yeah you were upside down and you had <laughs> uh, like multiple images on the screen there you go That's two one one two. yeah you can do like a side by side like that it's kind of, i guess it's for podcasting you know or whatever people like to you know show their face and their screen at the same time while they you can record video and stuff and yeah, now now people are showing up here <laughs> Sorry, late, working still. <laughs> Here's another one for John. <clears throat> that was out of a, a waste gun of a uh, B-24. Pretty sure it was the B-24 that day. I can't remember. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. Look at that. Miss, Miss Piggy. Did you see the uh, old uh, planes flying around today? <laughs> That's an the, the what now? <laughs> there were some... Uh, Old uh, World War II, I don't know what they were. Uh, four of them, I think, flying all over Santa Barbara today. Oh, today? Yeah. I should, I don't know, my, my son-in-law is one of the pilots. <clears throat> I, have an, a, I have a reservation, actually, on, uh, on one of the, the B-17 crashed uh, last November, I think it was, in uh, Connecticut, killed about half the people we're riding on it that day but uh the other two are the 25 and the 24 are still b25 b24 still flying and uh i have i have a reservation to have my ashes scattered like tomorrow no, no, <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't 
he didn't he wouldn't tell me when so no i well, can you get your antenna up first yeah, yeah. well it might be easier to disassemble them. you know i was thinking about the the club today uh, because I came to the port, point, uh, port, the point where you are, um, you have an option to uh, use uh, um, conductive paste to make it easier to take apart later. It prevents oxidation, oxidization of the of the tubing. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, and I didn't have any, and I really thought about, geez, you know, I wanted to get the thing up, so I just went ahead and put it. So you're going to have to use a wrench or something. To, to... <laughs> All right. I think we've got enough here. We can get started there. I'm sure we'll get a few more here. Um, <clears throat> so let's, uh, call the meeting to order here. And uh, as is our tradition. Oh, wait, I got to find my flag here. Where is it? Um, Okay, there we go. So we'll start off by saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Indivisible, justice for all. Play ball. A company. Yeah. The uh, all right. Let's go around and introduce ourselves. I'm gonna. I'll pick you out in the order that I'm looking at you. So, David Hackleman. Hi, I'm Dave Hackleman. I'm uh, uh, living in San Bernardino. And uh, what what else? Oh, I'm Kilo Six Victor Mike Lima. Okay, and I'm Brian K Six BPM. And Doc, you're you and you and your ship are next. Mute, you're muted. Twenty <clears throat> sixty W, Doc. I'm uh, I'm I'm rarely mute, uh, but sometimes I am. And uh, I'm a retired uh, physician and um, um, and ham radio operator. <laughs> uh, Dave AI six VX. Uh, Dave, AI6VX out of Ventura. All right, let's see if Rod has any audio. Uh, you got any audio, Rod? Guess not. Uh, Levi. Um, Levi, K6 LCM, still on the Mesa, even after last night. Now you know how I feel all the time. Yeah, <laughs> we were standing. Well, I wasn't standing out in the street. I was in the backyard, but looking for it. But my neighbors, I guess, had a better view from across the street. They could actually see the flames from over here by uh, Lazy Acres. Yeah, God, I went to bed early. I'm sorry I did. I missed the excitement. Joe, you're next, Joe. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. Unmute. Unmute, Joe. <laughs> nah, you didn't want to. Okay. Bottom one. That's, that's what you get for giving your wife the mute switch. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ron, you're next. Yeah, Ron Gibbons. Whiskey six kilo kilo golf over here in uh, Rancho Santa Barbara Mobile Home Park in Nolita. Marina. Yep, Marina King, KA6JWL on Hitchcock. And Wayne. Wayne, no you're audio, muted. Wayne. No. Who are you calling? Wayne. Okay, I'm going to have to drop off. I got a work call. Be back in a bit. Check you in. Or I'll just mute. I'll be back. Uh, okay, while, while Wayne works on his audio, RQV, oh. Michael. Good evening, everybody. Michael K6RQV out here in Galita. I don't worry about the fires. I just worry about the tsunamis. About 10 minute walk to the beach. So. 
Are you in the closet? No, I'm in happy hour. Oh, okay. A trick, trick question. <laughs> okay. It always sounds a little like he's on the Starship Enterprise when I was he just saying, <laughs> or something. Okay, Gary. Uh, you're muted, Gary. You can unmute people too, I think, Brian. I can ask them. Oh. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, there you go. Hey, uh, it, what, yeah, my wife's going to run in. Yeah, I, I'm here. Join me. Thank you. It's just a little challenging. Thanks. Okay, uh, Gerald. Uh, Gerald Kolcheski up in Rancho Embarcadero, KG6VKX. Okay, uh, Ken, are you there? I guess not. Okay, then Tom is the last one I can see here, and he is on a call, so uh, that's it. Um, all right, you want to try again, Wayne? Did you get your audio fixed, Wayne? Doesn't sound it. No. I guess not. Yeah, I get my audio back. Yeah, Thanks, you're Joe. okay now, Joe. No, okay. Yep, you're good. Could, can you hear us okay? How's that? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you okay. Okay. Okay, things are working now. All right, good. That's what we need. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Let me bring you up to date on any club news going on here. The um, We are, if anybody's noticed that we have a lot of trouble with... Um, uh, with the San Inez Peak repeater uh, when it's uh, linked through to um, the other repeaters in the system that it drops out a lot. And uh, the, we're, we're working on a fix for it and uh, we're in the process of, of figuring out what it'll cost. And uh, uh, we know how to resolve it. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna be going with, a, instead of going over the microwave link, we're gonna go with the, uh, uh, 440 uh, dedicated RF link between the two points so that we will have uh, very reliable performance. It'll be a lot like the UCSB receiver that's just runs and runs and runs and always there and always reliable. And so we're working on that. So hopefully in a month or two, we'll have those problems resolved and we'll be very well connected. The uh, I know that uh, let me see. I got another person to admit here. Okay, the uh, I know that the uh, uh, Bill and uh, Paul down in Ventura have the one four five one six repeater linked. Uh, it's operating very well, and it is um, going to be uh, eventually linked to San Luis Obispo. So we'll actually have a a solid RF linked. Um, uh, a tri-county radio system that we can use to communicate between the counties and uh, who knows we get the, they have some uh, nets that they I don't know if people are even aware of this but there's some nets that they do down in Ventura that they put on this uh, repeater um, at certain times so there's a, a whole nother set of uh, there's a net for for newbies I think and uh, a couple of other ones that they that they broadcast over both repeaters and um so there's some other additional entertainment options for us. The uh, link to Diablo out on the island works very well. People down in Ventura County and uh, uh, they have, uh, it's really improved. Uh, like Dave, AI6VX used to have to check into the nets on Echolink. And uh, speaking of Echolink, how you doing, Jerry? I see you logged in there. NU6B. The uh, we have kind of retired Echo Link at least for the time being because 
what was happening is is Echolink takes a large amount of bandwidth, um, and um, when we had a lot of people on Echolink, especially in the mornings, the we were having difficulty uh, the with uh, bandwidth up at the uh, repeater site on the Mesa, and our YouTube feed from the island, our live camera was dropping off all the time, and we'd have to go in and restart it and it was a lot of hassle and uh, when we turned off echo link everything got better um, we uh, it ran last uh, it ran for 42 days straight without a hitch and then we had an environmental issue or something and and it had to we had to restart the camera what it wasn't because it dropped because of uh, poor bandwidth so <clears throat> the um, uh, it was another issue entirely so those things are to be expected. So uh, I mean, that's that's improving. Um, the uh, people that did use Echolink, some of them have gone to All Star nodes, and All Star nodes can connect right directly to the All Star system, and they don't seem to cause the performance issues that Echolink does. So we can handle All Star nodes. So keep that in mind, Jerry, if you want to. <laughs> You know, the, some of the guys are building them. Um, the 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 technology has improved. They're not. It's not as clunky as it used to be. And uh, there's some nodes that you can buy already pre-configured, and you just set them up to uh, um, uh, point to uh, our our node at the at the at the repeater up at the on the mesa, and you got real good communications. It's excellent. Sounds like you're right here in town. So. Um, there's none of that delay and, and uh, it, they, they perform very well. So uh, it's an option to consider. I don't know, when we can improve the bandwidth up there, we may try Echolink again. We're, we're already working on a project to improve the bandwidth. Um, the weak link is that we have uh, microwave dishes at the club station where the internet comes in and then the microwave from there goes to Lavagia or as we call it now, the Tulanian Communications Facility. And uh, from there, it goes to the island and up to San Ynez Peak. So we have an awful lot of stuff coming over that one link between the Red Cross and uh, the Mesa. And uh, that's where the bottleneck ends up. So it's just a, it's a matter of engineering both computer and, and radio and trying to make everything fit and make everything work with what we have. So without breaking the bank on, on uh, problem is we can't get direct internet up on the Mesa. So we have to do it that way. And uh, the, uh, the closest internet is oh, quite a ways away. Uh, every, are all the shop gone? Is that you, Ken? Uh, it was. <laughs> okay. Hi, Dorothy. Dorothy. Oh, there you are. All right. Hi. Hi, Dorothy. I, I can't ever do that. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about some home automation stuff. Did any of you guys ever play with X10 stuff 40 or 30 years ago? No, or two, or two weeks ago. Probably a lot of you guys did. I mean, does, does, does this thing look familiar? <laughs> this was yes. the... Back in the 40 years ago, and then I had one. Yeah, I've still got a couple. I use them. <laughs> you know, you got, you had, uh, you go to the Radio Shack or you go somewhere and you'd buy Radio Shack that's, had that's their own brand of X10, and then they had some other ones. And, and, uh, but you go buy a, a, a lamp module like this or an appliance module and a little remote control thing like this. And you plug your lamp into the bottom of that, plug it in the wall, and then you could turn it on and off with this. And in the days before we even had PCs, this stuff was around, and this is what you used if you wanted to automate your house. Now, if you want to get fancy and do things on a, I don't have one here, but if you want, they had a, a little digital clock that had four on and off switches on it that you could set to A and B and so you could control eight devices and you could program these devices to come on and off at certain times. And of course, there's a nine volt battery in there that didn't seem to be able to keep the memory for very long if the power went out. And uh, 
the uh, uh, that was the state of home automation for quite a while. Um, the uh, a lot of people, interestingly enough, X10 is still around and they're still basically the same design. They're they're real easy to use for for anybody because the uh, they have little dials on the front. You can see that. And you set a house code, so you can set your house code to whatever you want. It's A through uh, uh, P, and so you can, and then you set a unit code, and that's 1 through 16. And then you'd set your remote control to the same house code, and then you've got the, uh, um, you have the buttons for each of these, and then you have a 1 through 8 and 9 through 16 switch. So one control could... Uh, one re remote control could control 16 devices. And, uh, you know, so you could, I guess, turn on your, you know, your, your porch light or, or uh, your uh, um, light by the bed or whatever without having to, to uh, uh, get up out of your chair. The, uh, then about, oh, I'd say probably around 88 or 89, somebody came up with a uh, program that ran on a PC. It was called Home Seer, and it controlled X10 devices. And for the first time, you could automate on computer, you could automate all your X10 devices. And you could uh, put programs in, so it would come on at, uh, at certain times and go off at certain times. And they had uh, some interesting features in there, like they had a security setting, so it would go on and off at different times. Like if you wanted to go out, something to go off at 10 o'clock, one night it would go off at 9.55, and another night it would go off at 10.06, or so that it would make it look like you were home, basically keeping this the, your normal schedule, but not always right on time. So when all your lights go on at exactly six o'clock and go off at exactly 11 o'clock, you know, burglars or whatever might get the idea that you're kind of, you know, you're using a timer on them or something. And, and that's exactly what was happening. So the uh, a little while later as, a, as an improvement, they, they added an ephemeris to it. So it could tell when sunset was and sunrise was. So you'd be able to uh, uh, have your lights come on at sunset, no matter what time of the year it is and uh, you know, have uh, in maybe outdoor lights or something that you, you know, go off at, uh, at sunrise. So it gave you a lot of options. Now that program Home Seer is also still around. They're, uh, <clears throat> they've advanced, but uh, since then there have been a lot of improvements uh, in home automation. The, uh, uh, there's some big names now in this and I'm gonna show you a couple of them. Uh, let me see, where's my thing here? The, um, let's see, well, first let's look at the, at the X10 website here. Let me size this appropriately. And I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. This is the X10 website, and if you ever had X10 things, a lot of these things look familiar to you. These wall switches right here were, were uh, the closest you could get to automating things that were already, uh, you know, uh, installed, like uh, kitchen lights and bathroom lights and front porch lights. And then um, the... Uh, um, when you use the X10 with uh, uh, the remote control, you always needed to have one of these little devices. It was a little transceiver that would listen for the, for the remote control and turn it into a power line uh, request. Uh, X10 works over your power line. It transmits a signal over the power line somewhere around 130 some kilohertz. And um, anybody that had X10s probably had, went through all the problems of, uh, you know, getting it phased properly. If you had uh, uh, your control unit on your on one phase of your of your uh, home uh, um, uh, AC um, uh, system, 
and your outlets or whatever you were controlling was on another phase, the X10s didn't always see them. So you'd have to buy another device that you'd have to plug in uh, or attach to your panel or plug into a 220 um, socket somewhere. So you could fa uh, provide uh, signals to both phases of your power. The, uh, it was a lot of experimentation, a lot of goofing around, um, trying to get things to work and they didn't always work all the time. So it, uh, but they had quite a few things and uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the old X10 website, but they had everything under the sun there and the thing looked like a circus. A um, few years ago, about 10 years ago, I decided I was going to automate my house completely. I had a couple of switches in, but I wanted to, I wanted to uh, add some new, new things and, and some better features. So I looked all around and looked at the options and and I went with a system that was called uh, um, Insteon and uh, let me see Insteon is a lot more capable than X10. Uh, uh, Insteon uses a what it's what they call a dual band system they they, they broadcast their signals over the uh, AC lines like X10 do at 132 kilohertz. And then they also use 950 megahertz uh, radios uh, in between each one of the switches or whatever device it is. They're, they're, uh, each one has a radio in it. So it broadcasts both power line signals and RF signals, uses a FSK protocol and uh, it sends uh, information to your installed switches and your whatever devices you have on uh, that are in Insteon compatible. Now the switches that are installed in the walls also work as repeaters. So you may have, uh, like I do, you may have, uh, you may be in one room and you may have uh, a light you want to control that's a uh, hundred feet away. Well, with X10 that really wasn't very reliable at all and usually didn't work at all the uh, uh but these if because i have switches installed all over the house when i uh, turn a uh, or tell the light to go on in in this room for example and it's clear across the other side of the house it might get repeated two or three times through the existing uh switches that are installed <laughs> So the, uh, uh, anyway, it makes it very efficient and um, Insteon makes all kinds of products for, uh, uh, somebody's got their, uh, they probably should mute all of them. Sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, uh, uh, they have, uh, for Insteon, they have uh, um, uh, thermostats, they've got sensors of all kinds, uh, thermometers, they've got uh, uh, embedded devices you can see right here um, that will go into existing light fixtures, for example, like if you have a chandelier and you wanna be able to control that, um, without you, you know, uh, actually using a switch, you can embed this in the, into that device. Um, the uh, they have uh, low voltage systems and irrigation systems, um, just all kinds of things. I actually have a, a 220. Uh, it's quite a good sized uh, unit too, and it's uh, it's it's a replacement for an intermatic. Uh, pool timer. You take the Intermatic uh, timer out and you put this, this uh, device in there and you can uh, control your pool pump and heater and all that stuff from, from by computer. So it lets you automate everything, pretty much everything. They, uh, they have all kinds of remote control devices. They have uh, uh, things for um, you know, uh, uh, washers and dryers, and they have sensors. If you you can put one on, under your water heater, and if your water heater starts leaking, you know it will uh, flash a light or or uh, make an alarm go off. 
Um, and then all of these are also controllable by computer. They all require a hub of some kind. Here you see an Insteon hub and the Insteon hub also has a phone app. So you can use your phone from anywhere and anywhere in the world, you can use your phone to control your uh, electricity at home. And they make that version. And then they make another version that looks like this. This is called a, a PLM, which means power line modem. And you plug it in and it, this also has radios inside. And then you plug a serial port into the bottom and you plug that a USB port and you plug that into your computer or to some other device that's gonna be the controller. And this handles all the translation so that it goes over the power lines and also uh, starts the initial radio broadcast. So the, the, uh, uh, they're fairly reliable. I've had most of my stuff in for 10 years now and I've replaced two of them uh, that went bad, but I've got close to 50 of them. So the two out of 50 isn't too bad. And uh, they have similar little things. If you just want to, if you just want to control a table lamp or something, um, they have, this is their version of the X10 thing. Now the downside to these is the programming. These where the X10s, all you had to do is take a screwdriver and flick, turn the dial and you were done. These have a little number on the back. Everyone has a little, you can see the number there. This one is 3E80OC and that's its addressable number. So if you want to, uh, you have to set that up in your phone app and you have to say, okay, this is a light and I want to control this and this is its number. And then it sets up little uh, buttons for you in your phone app. And you have to do that with every device. With the X10s, you can do that in a few minutes. With these, it's a little longer. But they're, they're very reliable. They do support things like uh, full dimming um, and, and the, the appropriate dimming. So if you have magnetic or something um, uh, 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 um, uh, like a, a low voltage magnetic lighting or something like that, they work great with those. Um, the, uh, I also was gonna say the, a lot of people, if you look at your thermostat, a common thermostat to use by heating guys is a company called Venstar. And uh, they also make a module that plugs right into the bottom of the Venstar thermostat and it controls your heating and air conditioning. And it's all programmable. Now there's some hey, other, Brian. yeah. Does it also handle fluorescence? Yes. Yeah, the fluorescence work really good. There's two models of wall switches. There's a dimmer and there's a, a switch. The switch is just a, a single pole, sing, a single pole double throw switch. And um, the dimmers, of course, have all the dimming circuitry and it uses a switch for fluorescence, but it handles them, them just fine. I have uh, all of them. I have a bunch in the garage and a bunch in my workshop and they're all on the remote switches, which is nice because it's, an, a, it's a separate building and sometimes if it's cold or if it's raining, which doesn't happen too often, uh, and I don't wanna go out there because I left the light on, uh, <laughs> I just press a button and the lights are off. Or now I tell Echo or tell my Amazon Echo device and it shuts them off for me. That's another thing. The Insteon hub, this particular hub is compatible with uh, uh, Amazon and Google and uh, the Google Assistant and, the, and all the others. So uh, you can program those devices and you can also talk to them and tell them what to do with your house. So um, that's kind of cool. The, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of other protocols that are available here. There's another one. You guys may have heard of Zigbee. If you've ever done this before, Zigbee is, is not really, they don't make products as much as it's a specification. It's a, it's a protocol. It uses a, um, a, uh, um, some very similar to Wi-Fi. Uh, it's, it's microwave band, 2.4 megahertz microwave band radio to communicate with these very various devices. And there's a bunch of them made by different manufacturers to do all kinds of things. They can open your curtains for you. Uh, pretty much all of them have uh, 
things for Venetian blinds and mini blinds and and curtains and uh, um, the uh, one of the big things now they do is they they let you uh, program scenes so you can say okay I want to have a you know TV scene or I want to have uh, something for watching a movie or something and it will you just press a button and it will dim your lights it will turn on your you know your DVD player it will start the movie and um, you know start your popcorn maker or whatever but uh, you can do all that with a touch of a button when you get around to uh, it, uh, you can do that a lot of that without just on your phone uh, with the uh, apps that are available for phones. Then you can get more complicated. Zigbee has a lot of neat stuff. There's a lot of neat stuff if you like to make things. Uh, you can buy Zigbee um, uh, boards for raspberries and uh, for uh, Arduinos. And you can uh, make devices that will control all kinds of things. If you have some particular need, and they, they don't already manufacture it, you can make your own. And uh, so it's, it's kind of neat. Um, the, uh, let me see what else I saved here. Um, okay, then you get down now, if you wanna, say you wanna start getting fancy and you wanna be able to uh, turn on groups of lights and uh, you know, maybe you've got four light switches that control your outside lights, or maybe you've got 10 light switches that control your outside lights and you wanna be able to turn them on all at once if you feel like it. Um, you can uh, look into a, 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 a device to control all that. Now you can, you can get software that you can run on a computer but it's got to run all the time. That's the problem. If it's a computer that you use all the time, it's got to stay on and it's got to stay connected. Um, what I'm using right now, <laughs> what I put in about 10 years ago, is a little box from this company called Universal Devices. And it's basically just a little, this, this one here, the ISY 99.4. And... Um, it's a little box that, uh, let me see if I can get it back over there and all. This here, it's a little box and it's got a little uh, computer that runs Linux and uh, it runs a Java application. And you can, let me see if they got a better picture of it here somewhere. Um, and uh, let's see, let me go to this. Oh, are you letting asshole out? Yeah. <laughs> You check to make sure the screen door is locked. I just realized I might not have locked it. All right, I will. And I also bought uh, CBD oil for them. Somebody's uh, microphone is on. Why don't you mute them? Well, because I'm presenting the screen. Well, you should have a co-host that could do that. Okay, I'm making you co-host. Okay. <laughs> There you go, Dorothy. Oh, it looks like they already muted themselves. So. Okay. Good. Thank well, thank you. <laughs> I'm making you a co-host there anyway. That way you can do the muting for me. Okay. All right. Now, these these are pretty neat. When I bought mine, it was $500. Now they're down to $169. And um, the, uh, they're... The, they're, they're, they're very reliable. They just keep running and running and running. I think I had initially bought a 991 10 years ago and then I, I replaced it with a 994, not because I had to, but because I wanted to, just because I wanted the latest. Now, the neat thing is, is that this supports the, all three of the formats that I just uh, showed you, the Insteon, the X10, and um, the, uh, um, what was the other one, Zigbee, and they also support Z-Wave, which is another, another protocol. And uh, so you can mix and match devices. You're not stuck with all one brand. You can, you can buy different devices and mix them up. But the, the really neat thing about these is the ability to program them and to have them do things. Now, one thing when I built my house is, is I thought I was pretty good about deciding where switches should be for different rooms, different devices, different lighting. And I made one mistake. We have a, a kitchen that has, it's very, it's, uh, you come in the front door, you make a right turn and you go into the kitchen and that's where I put the lights for the, 
the light switch for the for the kitchen lights that we end up using all the time, which are above the cabinets and below the cabinets. And problem is, is that when we go out, we always come in through the side door, which is in the breezeway, and it also comes into the kitchen. And I didn't put a switch there. And um, so by with this uh, uh, programming, I was able to set it up. So when I open the door in the breezeway where there's no switch uh, and I turn on another light, it will also turn on the kitchen lights at the same time, the cabinet lights. So the, uh, and I did that through, just through programming. You can set these up to listen for another switch. For example, if uh, say you want to, say you're caring for an elderly relative and you want to know if the light goes on in their bathroom in the middle of the night, right? And you want it to turn on your light by the bed so it wakes you up and you can go help them or whatever. You can program the device to do that so that it will, uh, another switch activating will cause another action to happen. So there's all kinds of possibilities. The, 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 these are real neat little units. Um, the, uh, the thing that, the only thing I don't like about it, and I'm gonna show you here, let me stop sharing this screen and I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share a different screen. Let me see, this is the, programming software right here. The, uh, the programming software is a Java application, which kind of runs funny. It, it, you load it off of the device itself. And what you can see here is all the little devices I have programmed in here. And I can turn them on and off from here. But really what you, the big thing is, uh, is once you get all your devices in there and they're all specified what they are, you want to be able to program it. Now, this is the programming. It's, it's fairly simple. It's not really complicated, but you know, you can, um, uh, for instance, like this program says, if time is sunset plus 10 minutes, I want uh, to, I want it to run another program called front lights. I want it to run a program called garage night lights. I want to pro run a program called outside barbecue light. Uh, one outside my office here and another one uh, to turn uh, some lights on the fireplace that are on the, on the mantle. And um, the uh, so I write one program, then whenever it's sunset plus 10 minutes, it turns all these lights on for me. And then later on at night, it turns them off uh, in different order. The couple of them, one outside by the barbecue light stays on all night. One goes off at 11. Another one goes off at uh, another one is uh, just a, 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 a LED bulb out in the garage that we leave on till about midnight. And um, the uh, um, and then there's one that goes from uh, uh, full bright down to very dim and stays on all night. So the uh, um, and you can do all that here. It's got a little wizard down here at the bottom which helps you. So for example, if I want to change the time up there, uh, I can go down to this wizard down here. And so it's, um, this event is going to fire at 10 minutes right here after sunset. And I can make that anything I want. I can have it daily. I can have it only do it on certain days. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, it, uh, and when, it, when Christmas rolls around, I do, a, I do a lot of lights. So you see over here, I got a whole bunch of these for different Christmas things here. Now, for most of them, I use X10 devices because I can set them all on the same channel and I can turn them on with one command. But I have other ones that are in different locations and I have some that are waterproof switches that are built for being outside and uh, handle uh, higher amperage. And uh, I use some of those and then I use some uh, things that dim some of the lights. I have the Christmas lights. We have some icicles we put up and about 10 o'clock at night, I dim them down to about 50% and the lights are still on, but they're just not on so bright. And so if you want to go to bed, they don't bother you. And then the lights go off about 11 o'clock or something. And uh, the, uh, so that gives you a whole lot of flexibility. And unfortunately, this program has been around for, 
they update it all the time, but it's been around for 10 years and it really is not very sophisticated by today's standards. And you can see it's still got tool buttons up here, which are pretty much obsolete. And, um, you know, and it's uh, like I said, a Java application. It's not a Windows application and it's not a Mac application. It runs on everything, but it's clunky. It's slow to load. And uh, I have to come back to a computer to change anything. So um, if I'm out somewhere and I want to change my programming, uh, I can't do it from with this. Now, the uh universal devices let me go back to that screen um they have a service a cloud service now which does let you connect remotely and you can use your iphone an iphone application uh but they charge you for it it's you know 12 or 15 dollars a month for this and that's i didn't want that i didn't want to have to to pay every month to be able to turn my lights on and off. So I've been looking around for a couple of years and uh, I came across the other day, I was reading some stuff and I came across a, uh, a, uh, a new uh, uh, open source program and it's called, oh, this is mine, Wait a second, let me go to the website. It's called OpenHab and it is a, open source um, home automation program, or really it's much more than just home automation. And you can load it on a Raspberry Pi. It comes, you can uh, go to the download area here and there's an image for a Raspberry Pi that you can just download and you put it on a little card and put it in your Raspberry Pi and it's yours. Now the neat thing is, is these guys support everything. Everything that is made for home automation is basically supported. Um, these are all the various Insteon devices that they, that they uh, this on the left here, I'm scrolling through the various uh, devices. And then they've got some uh, Zigbee down here and Z-Wave devices. They, can, they are compatible with smart TVs so if you have a recent model Samsung or something like that, it can uh, turn on a certain channel for you at a certain time. Um, they're compatible with all the various Wi-Fi enabled uh, light bulbs that you can get. Um, the the um, there's just uh, pretty much they're they're compatible with uh, TiVo's with. Um, you know, all, this, all the different streaming devices. So um, it can control those for you. You can literally with these, you can, this program, you can program your whole day and never have to get out of your chair unless you have to use the restroom or, or you have to eat or something. Um, they will tie into smart appliances. You know, they'll tell you what the temperature is in your thermometer, if your refrigerator or what your temperature is in your refrigerator, if it supports that. Um, they have all kinds of different things. The one thing that really interested me is that they support uh, uh, my weather station. I have a Davis weather station and they're famous for not uh, really being compatible with anything. It's, it's, uh, I have a weather website and it's a lot of work. I, it requires a three computers really to three devices to keep that, to keep a website running. And um, I wanted something that would allow me to also do things based upon the weather. So um, I get up early in the morning and, and I have some lights come on about the time I come out that I usually get up. So when I go out in the kitchen, the lights on and, and, um, the, uh, uh, and then I have it turn it off. Uh, but some days when it's this time of year and it's really overcast in the morning, it's still dark kind of when I get up. Well, this has a, this, since it can tie into the weather station, it can tell me how much light is outside and it can adjust my lighting according to how much outside light I have. So if it's a real dark day, if it's a rainy day or whatever, your lights might stay on a little longer in the morning uh, until they go off, until it gets a little lighter. And so it's really, it's smart and it allows you to uh, 
It lets you connect to various weather services. So if you don't have a weather station, you can still get the weather from Weather Underground, from um, uh, uh, Dark Sky, from several uh, uh, sources. You can get the current conditions um, uh, and find out what what you know and and make your 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 um, home system um, do things according to that. So. Now, if you have, say you have a, uh, an electric uh, awning that comes out from the side of your house and, um, you know, if it's going to be windy, it'll roll it up for you. If it's uh, going to be uh, a sunny day or something, it'll, you know, it'll uh, put, put your awning down for you. So it lets you do a lot of really cool things. The, uh, so I downloaded it and I set it up. And I, the X, the uh, Raspberry Pi cost me about 40 bucks with the case and, you know, maybe 50 bucks altogether with a power supply and all that. And uh, so it's the only bad thing about this is that this particular version is brand new and there's not a lot of documentation for it. Um, I have this set up. I have all my devices in here. You can see the the, uh, these are all my different devices. They call them things. And uh, from here, you, you, you first you set up all your devices, all your things. And then when you have them set up, the, uh, you, you uh, see here's the address that I put in there that I showed you on the back of that. Product key is a code for the so lamp link switch dimmer or a dimmer. Um, and then you uh, uh, you set it up with a bridge. So a bridge would be one of these devices here or a hub or something like that, that uh, it can interface with. So it can send it commands. And then you enable various th functions that the switch performs or the whatever device it is. Like uh, for example, if it supports dimming, you enable dimming. Uh, if it supports on and off, you, you, you enable that. Uh, so then you end up with a whole long list of things that you've enabled uh, and, and uh, different things like I have it integrated with my weather station. So it's telling me right here the dew point outside is 36.3 degrees. So I can go down and see other things. It will tell me the status of anything that's, that's on. Uh, it tells me, let's see, tells me what the temperatures are or what the uh, temp the th thermostats are set at and I have two of them. Um, it gives you a whole bunch of information but what you're basically doing when you define all this is you're creating a database and from the database once you have all that defined then it gets a little bit easier and then you can go back and you can do things like you can set up your own little buttons to do things. So right now my garage lights are on and my workshop lights are on. So my wife must be out there goofing around. She's probably in my workshop and she shouldn't be. So I should turn the lights off. I can uh, turn on uh, floodlights in different areas. I, I'm still working on populating these. Uh, tells me what the, the uh, temperature in the living room and the kitchen are both uh, 70 degrees. Um, and then from here, you can design different screens. Now, this is actually a website that I'm visiting and it's on the Raspberry Pi. And there's a free uh, service, a free cloud service that it integrates with that allows you to connect to your home automation system uh, from, your, from your phone from anywhere. So, um, and it does, you don't have to pay a nickel for it. So, um, it, you can create one of these that uh, with the little uh, switches on it, you can put the you can put uh, icons on it, like an on light bulb or an off light bulb or a, a thermometer, or you can have gauges. Uh, I haven't got quite got that far yet, but you can set them up any way you want. And there's probably an army of a couple of hundred people that are writing interesting things for this. And they're just plugins and you just download them and put them in and it gives you that capability. But it all runs on a little Raspberry Pi, which is just... I don't think I have one here handy, but you know they're a little bit bigger than a deck of cards, and uh, you just plug it in 
plug in one of these devices into the uh, uh, USB port. And once you get it configured, you can make screens for phones, you can make them for pet tablets, you can make them for computers. And the, uh, when I go look at the, uh, I can go to the settings and you can see that there's uh, pages so this is a, you can create any page you want with any kind of layout that you want. So um, you, uh, some people are actually using them for, for uh, to create layouts for uh, um, uh, little monitors that they mount on the wall and they can, uh, you can, they can see their weather, they can see the forecast. Um, you can find out how many minutes until it's gonna start raining. It just depends on how much time you wanna spend on playing with it. But uh, it's really neat and it's very inexpensive <laughs> and it integrates with a lot of uh, other things. And I'm gonna, let me show you one more thing here. The, um, there's a thing on the internet, it's called If This Then That, it's just a website. And it integrates, it lets devices talk to each other. So for example, Say you have a home automation system, but you want to get a text when um, you know when the light goes on in the kitchen, and you might be anywhere, and you wanted to send you a text saying the lights on in the kitchen. So you can use this program. You can send uh, from the other the, the home automation program. You can have it send a message to if this, this, then that, and then they have little applets here, little applications that you can use. And it will, you, you, it's very easy to use. It's just like little building blocks. And you say, okay, when it gets this signal, do this. And there's all kinds of other things. It can have it ring a bell in, in uh, Egypt, if you want it to, if you've got a bell in Egypt. And uh, the, the uh, it handles all the connections. If you wanted to send you a text, it'll send you a text and tell you what's going on. Or if you're traveling and you want to know if it's raining and you happen to have that ability, uh, uh, either with a personal weather station or you have your software connected to to um, uh, Weather Underground or one of the other weather services, it can tell you that it's raining in your neighborhood. So um, you can be, you know, in Europe or anywhere. Australia, Japan, China, uh, and you'll still get that information as soon as it starts happening. So there's uh, there's all kinds of other things you can um, you can have sensors. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for example, if you had a sensor that uh, um, sensed light and and um, you know it could tell you a light bulb is out and you need to replace it, send you an email or a text message. Uh, so you can you can not only use them for homes now you can use them for businesses for for uh, you know if you have um, um, uh, you know uh, other you know friends that you take care of or you know need to need to know that they're okay uh, you, if you have a cabin somewhere in the mountains you can use them there you can find out if you're uh, uh, need to turn on your, you know, if you need to turn on your, uh, if you have a cabin up in the mountains and you need to turn on the heaters on the pipes to keep the pipes from freezing, you can do that. Uh, or if the water heater goes out, it can tell you. Um, so it can connect everything and it can give you information from, and let the information be shared from any, in any way that you want it. So it's, uh, I am kind of looking forward to getting this program all configured so that I can, I can uh, start exploring some of the other things. And of course, you can do scheduling. I haven't done anything in the scheduling yet, but it's it's very, very uh, uh, sophisticated how it lets you schedule things. You can set up uh, rules that, uh, for example, like when you come home and you turn on the kitchen lights, well. Uh, if it's after uh, sunset, for example, you can have it turn the living room lights on for you when you turn on the kitchen lights so that you'll come home, just press one button and it won't do it if you're, it won't turn them on in the daytime. It'll only turn them on if it's actually dark and uh, um, you can set up, uh, it's also got a calendar in it. It knows all the U.S. holidays so that if you have a different schedule on a holiday or on a weekend, uh, it can accommodate that. 
it's uh, it's uh, really it's a lot of work to make you very lazy. So the uh, uh, but it's fun to fun to play around with. Now for I was looking at this and I realized that there's some things that we do that the Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club does that would uh, that we might want to explore, you know, automating some of these things. So um, one of the things that we added to two of the repeater sites so far is a, is a uh, logging device that um, um, gives us information about the state of battery voltage and uh, uh, regular power, um, how many amps the equipment's drawing, the uh, um, if a generator comes on, uh, lets us know that. Uh, so there's quite a few things that um, that we can monitor with these devices. Now, this program I just showed, you can actually read those logs and it can parse information out of those logs and it can make decisions and do remedial actions uh, remotely based upon what it reads in those logs. So you can you're not, it's not really artificial intelligence, but it's, it's approaching that by being able to um, uh, create um, uh, 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 so take the software and create uh, uh, commands so that if, uh, say, if voltage goes down to, uh, gee, 11 volts, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the shack voltage or the radio voltage uh, goes down to 11 volts. Uh, maybe you'd want to send out a couple of mails. Maybe you'd want to shut down other equipment to make sure that uh, something else isn't uh, drawing too much. Or maybe something else is uh, indicating that there's a software problem on, one, on a computer. And maybe you want to reboot the computer. Um, you can do all this in this one program, and you can do it by reading logs. You can do it by um, uh, what they, there's a, a term for it, I can't remember, but it, it, what, it, what it does, it looks for lack of information. So if you have something that normally reports to it every so often and it doesn't report, um, you can take a remedial action like rebooting a computer or um, uh, in some cases, um, uh, and we have a lot of things like our all-star thing is a computer. Uh, um, our all-star equipment all runs on a computer. Uh, so you can really get out there in the weeds and find all kinds of ways to make your life easier. So one person can, can actually get a lot of stuff done. <laughs> like Wayne there, you can see him there, he's working on, he's got some cavities on the floor. Anyway, all right. Well, that's. I just wanted to kind of show you guys some of the new stuff that's coming along. The anybody that if you've got any um, home automation stuff now, uh, you know, I, I'll uh, you know you can send me an email and I'll send you links to all these things. You can look at this uh, uh, software. Raspberry Pis are exceedingly e easy to work with. You just put one in a case and put a uh, so burn the, the uh, software to a little uh, micro SD card, just one of these little cards like this that you use in your camera, put it in the Raspberry Pi, and it's ready to go. And uh, it's real easy to use. And then you can just connect to it with your computer with a web browser. So there's nothing to be afraid of. And um, the, you know, it runs you through a little setup program and you choose a password and do all this kind of thing and, and uh, you're, you're, you're good to go in, in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes and it sets itself up and, and then you can start programming your devices. So works with, um, if you have any like uh, Amazon Echo devices, if you have any uh, Google Assistant devices or uh, Siri devices, works with all that stuff and you can, uh, uh, start uh, having a lot of fun. Anybody have any questions? Well, comment, but not a question. Uh, comment, but not a question. Yeah, it uh, seems like it would work out pretty well to help aid your security. Uh, Ken was having problems, as an example. If he could set up some sensors, uh, he would be able to automate when this guy was coming around and climbing fences and getting into things and 
And if you've got a mobile home or an, uh, a motor home at the side of your house, you, you hardly ever visit it. You don't want to go in there to find out that somebody had broken into it a couple months prior. You might be able to set up some uh, security type, you know, or sensors to detect, hey, hey, the door was opened when nobody was around. Do different things to yeah. warn you. Exactly. And, you know, one of the one of the things that's that if if you you can get these things, but if you say call Cox Cable, for instance, and you say, gee, I'd like a security camera and I'd like it to be able to notify me or even ring doorbell or something like that. Um, you know, before you know it, you're spending, you know, 30, 40 bucks a month for this stuff. And um, over a course of a few years, that's a lot of money. And you can do it all for, for nothing. You can buy a Raspberry Pi and have all that set up for 50 bucks. And for another $100, $100 you can buy a very basic system for uh, uh, hooking up, uh, uh, you know, some, some sensors and, and, and uh, transmitting that information to the machine. And as long as you have an internet connection available, Wi-Fi connection, even if you live in a mobile home, maybe you're not there all the time, but maybe your neighbor would let your you know, device communicate to their Wi-Fi in an emergency. And uh, you can do all that for, for you know, maybe $150. And you're not paying any monthly fees. And uh, you can expand it. You can, um, uh, it, there, it's also compatible with virtually every IP camera on earth. I mean, they've got the, anything that works over uh, you know an Ethernet cable or wireless, this this little uh, they've got uh, plugins for those cameras. So even they'll 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 even read the motion settings from the cameras. So you just really need a dumb camera, and it will tell it will pick up the motion uh, itself. The software will, and it will take a picture if necessary, mail you a picture. It'll do all those things that you're paying ring doorbell for and all that, but it'll do them for. Uh, once you pay for the equipment, it does it for free. But that's uh, that's you're you're exactly right. For guys like Ken, you could put a sensor in that would the sensor would start when the guy starts walking down the path, right? You know, way before he gets to the camera, and it would turn the camera on. So by the time the guy gets around the corner to the can where the camera is getting him, it's already going. So you know he's got some warning ahead of time. You know. And uh, it can even do the recording of the images. So uh, uh, that's, you know, there's just all kinds of things. It's finally somebody, they got together and they said, instead of making something that does something, let's make something that does everything. You don't even have to have any devices at all. It'll still do things with just free things that you can access on the internet, like weather and and sending texts and things. You can actually just have the software and have it email you when it starts to rain, if you want, you know? I mean, you're gonna have to take, uh, you know, Dark Sky's word for it or Weather Underground's word for it that it's raining, but it, it will still say if they're, you know, if, or if Santa Barbara Airport's recording, you know, that we that it's it started to rain, uh, you know, close enough, right? <laughs> it's raining in your neighborhood anyway. So there's a, it's just a, a, especially people that travel or people that might want to be able to, uh, uh, maybe your neighbor calls and says, you know, gee, we saw somebody hanging around your house. Well, you can just pull your phone out if you have one of these and turn all your lights on around the outside for the night, you know, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's easy to do. And the, uh, once you got it set up, you can pretty much do anything you want. Any other comments? Thank you, Brian. Good presentation. Well, kind of. I, I wanted to spend some more time on it, and then I, something came up. I was going to do a better present presentation, but a couple things came up that took a lot of time. And uh, oh, Excellent, uh, Brian. Excellent presentation. Uh, I guess my the biggest question for me, though, is uh, what kind of bridges you know you were talking about how it handles all these different devices I, I different uh brands i guess each brand end ends up having to have a bridge somewhere so that it can communicate with it right 
Yeah, the the ones that require bridges are the ones, especially the ones that use power line uh, signaling, like X10. Uh, X10 has a has a device that's similar to this, and they also had that one that they've had for years. It has a little antenna that uh, plugs into the wall, and um, the the uh, but you need with these you need a, a bridge. Fortunately, this for the Insteon also works as a bridge for X10 works as a bridge for Zigbee and it works for, as a bridge for Z-Wave. So one of these will let you control everything. Now, so there's some others that require uh, a specialized bridge. The, uh, now it works directly with Amazon devices with no bridge. So if you have a, like a, you can buy Amazon smart plugs for your walls, you know, uh, you plug them in and they're Wi-Fi basically. So it'll work with your Echo devices, but it will also work with, uh, uh, well, Amazon has a kind of rudimentary timer system. Uh, it's just pretty much on and off on a schedule, um, but you can get into the more sophisticated stuff because this, of course, being, this is connect, these little boxes are connected to the internet. And so the, uh, you, you just uh, 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 sign into your Amazon account and it can send all the commands for the Amazon devices and then no bridges are needed. It's just using internet or Wi-Fi. And then any Wi-Fi devices that are simply Wi-Fi, like Wi-Fi light bulbs. Uh, there's a lot of those, Philips makes them, uh, different companies. Um, and then uh, 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 TP-Link, the company that makes uh, routers and switches and things they also make a whole bunch of controls and they're uh, uh also wi-fi linked so any of the wi-fi link things there's no bridge needed it's just uh it it's uh you install the plugin for that device and you can install all the plugins you want so one system can you know somebody gives you one for christmas and they didn't do any research as to what you need no problem you you, you you've got it you know or somebody comes out with something really cool or uh some uh uh, well, for example, like Samsung televisions have a have a Wi-Fi interface uh, that's available to Samsung equipment, uh, you know, like remote controls and Samsung tablets and that kind of stuff. And I think there's apps that you can get for other devices, but you can. Uh, uh, it's also accessible over Wi-Fi for uh, your uh, home automation stuff. So if you have a you can set it up for your television schedule for the whole week in advance if you want to. And it will go from this station to this station to this station, turn the TV on, turn it off and uh, uh, take care of everything for you. So the uh, um, I can see that being very helpful, uh, the ability to control it remotely. When my mom was living, one of the worst, one of the most inconvenient calls I got was I can't get my remote control to work. <laughs> and she'd press the button on it that would change it from, you know, there was one of these Cox remote controls and they have buttons on the top and one of, you have to press one to control the TV, another one to control something else. And I don't know, but she would get it messed up and I would have to drive over to her house and press the right buttons to get it back to control the television. Well, you know, imagine if she, if you could just go to your computer or your phone or whatever, say, what channel do you want to watch, mom? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and change the channel and, and uh, you know, then uh, uh, or do do something else or, or even, uh, uh, you know, potentially uh, reset the, you know, uh, whatever device she was having a problem with, but that happened all the time. I mean, people get old and they just get confused and being able to, to uh, help them out and, and uh, do things, or if, if they're, uh, um, you know, uh, want to check on them, make sure that they're, uh, you can see what lights they've got on. And, you know, if you see a light on all night, that shouldn't be on all night and they're not answering the phone, gee, maybe you, Maybe you need to go check on them or something. And so there's just a lot of possibilities. It's inexpensive, I mean, relatively. When you look at, the, especially for like elderly people, they have these little things that they wear around their neck and they press the button and they pay 40, 50 bucks a month for that. 
you know, and you can you can do the same exact thing with the, with a little device and press a button and it will call you or send you a text immediately saying somebody and then you can make the decision whether to call an ambulance or a fire department or whatever, you know, but uh, uh, for people on Social Security and things of 30, 40 bucks is a lot of money every month. Hey, when you say when I get old, I get confused. I resemble that remark. <laughs> Can we experiment on you, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I heard old. I heard old is a state of mind. My therapist has whiskers. There you go. <laughs> well, at least you admit you have a therapist. Hey, Brian, can you hear me? It's Ken. I can. Hey, quick question on the if then this website. I you've mentioned that before a couple of years ago, and I've always been curious. Why does why why do you need that? Why can't you just do the just do the push notifications directly from the Raspberry Pi, for instance? What's the purpose of having this other piece in between? The uh, because it's really easy to do. The uh, uh, it's very flexible. They've got people that have written all this stuff and experimented and made things that all work uh, without having to, you know, have a PhD in electronics or computer science. Um, the uh, I'm not aware. I mean, doing push notifications and is not necessarily for timid people. You know, the the uh, um, or sending emails or configuring it to send emails and, and going through the setup to, to uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, use the correct security login or TLS or whatever you're gonna use to send an email to authenticate it correctly. And I mean, that, that's a huge problem for anybody setting up a device like that. But these guys, it, it, I mean, they, they, the, it, the, if this, if this, then that, you, if you're just an individual, it costs you nothing. If you want to get really into it, um, you know, you can pay a monthly fee or something, but just for people like us, it just, it doesn't cost us anything. And somebody's already done all the hard work and you just type in a couple things and it works. So that's the, and it's very reliable. I've got, I've set up things. I'm not using anything right now, but I've set up things to play with and it just works. I mean, it's just brainless. And, uh, um, you know, it's something that an average person could set up without having to call and ask somebody. Hey, Brian, it's Gerald. Yeah, Gerald. Uh, a couple things, just a kind of a counterpoint. Um, you know, I use a system called Indigo on it's on a Macintosh based system, you know, and for example, on things that you were just talking about, it has built into it all the push notifications for like email and for um, text. Like, you know, I just got a couple minutes ago, I got the text telling me my spy heater just turned off and I also get an email. So I mean, you know, another approach is if you buy it and it's a commercial product, and I think I pay, it's a service, it's like $79 a year. <laughs> Um, you know, it's just a different approach, but they also have all the, um, you know, the interfaces to Zigbee, you know, multi-protocol, just like the other, the other stuff you're talking about. Um, so it's just another way if you want, if you don't want to have to roll it your own and put everything together, there are commercial products out there that do pretty much everything and they're pretty straightforward. And, you know, like the if then else stuff we were talking about, the conditionals. That stuff's all readily available just off, you know, menu choices. Um, and it actually even has APIs going back to um, things like Python. So you can do custom programming, declare variables, be able to do custom programming with it. So it's a pretty powerful you know, tool, very easy to use interface. You know, one of the things you mentioned earlier on, a couple, just a couple of questions I had for you about that. You know, for example, on the tool I use, I enter the address and then it goes out and actually interrogates the device on the network. And it comes back and, and loads it into the beta, database and tells it what type of device it is. Is it a dimmer? Is it a wall switch? Is it a 
an outlet on the wall, you know, it's in which, which one it is. So it makes that process fully automated. So basically you enter in the identifying uh, number for it and, and you're done. And then you're ready to integrate it into your scripts or if you want to do timers or, or any of the other ones. My point being is that there are programs that are fully integrated and also has a, it's a client server so I can access it from any of my computers. You can also access it from your phones, you know, so you have all the same kind of functionality, but it's all built in into one program. So it's just a little easier to manage if you don't want to roll to your own, like what you were talking about. Yeah. The other, the other question I had, have you heard about Project Chip? It was just announced about 10 days ago. It's an alliance between Apple, Amazon, and Google about coming up with a standardized interface for all of their devices. And the intent there is that for people doing the home automation stuff, finally we're gonna have the vendors gonna have a single single uh, API they're gonna be able to write to, to be able to integrate mixed vendor environments. So you can have Google devices, you can have Nest devices, you can have Apple devices. All of those will be able to be put together. And it's just, it's just now getting started. Zigbee was kind of the promise of that, but it never really materialized to mm -hmm. a very full degree. And so this new alliance, it's been in the, some of the trade uh, press um, and, and some of the companies are already coming out and stating they're supporting it. So it should actually get easier as time goes on. Yeah, I actually, I haven't read about that. The, uh, um, what, the thing that, that, I mean, they've tried this before. So I always take that with a little bit of skepticism, but uh, yeah, I think we all do. <laughs> you know, the the uh, uh, you know home home kit was supposed to do this stuff, and that's kind of you know, yeah. You know. yeah. Well, I think what we're going to see is like things like home kit's going to be integrated into. You know, the promise is that it's going to work with this project chip oh, interface, yeah. and so you know provide a low level of abstraction for the you know the tools to interface too. One yeah. other thing that you said early on. And I just, uh, the, when you're using Insteon devices, do you not link them together when you need to have ones that are multi, you know, multiple, it's like you have two lights in a room and you want to link them together. Do you not use the linking function in the device? Yeah. Okay. Cause you've made a statement that you have to, it's pretty tedious to have to go through and link them afterwards. Cause you can actually do it from the device. You don't even need the tool. Well, it depends how you want to do it. The, the uh, uh, you know, for example, I have a lot of three and four way switches mm -hmm. and they're all, they're all linked. I don't do them from the device, but I, I, I don't like that pressing the button and doing that. That, that's, yeah. Yeah. That, I, that's not, uh, that's never worked for well for me. I, I, I like to put the numbers in and then I like to link the device, but what I've done with mine and what I like this other program is because the uh, I have to I do it. It doesn't go out and recognize the when I put the number in. It doesn't interrogate it to find out what kind of device it is. But that isn't necessarily hard to do. But what I like to do is I like to take the events out and act on the events separately. Mm -hmm. So the uh, and this lets you do that. So for example, if I want to double tap a switch, mm -hmm. I can make it do something else. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's why this, this, there are, e this is, I, this is admittedly not the easiest program to use, but it's probably the most powerful that I've seen. So if you want, uh, if I want, for example, if I want to turn on uh, a light in a room for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. um, I can double tap that switch and it'll stay on for 10 minutes and it'll go off in 10 minutes. Yeah. So that by by trapping the events separately from from the from the general uh, switch capability and right. model number, um, which is why they which is why you go through the and tell it which which uh, uh, channels that you want to tap that or that you want to expose so so that you can test those conditions, and um, that's see I'm a computer programmer by profession. So those yeah, things- Yeah, I understand your perspective, yeah. Yeah, so I look at it like what is gonna, you know, I don't mind putting the extra work into it, 
Um, it's it's it isn't the it, it it's pretty easy if you just want to do simple things. If you want to do some fun things, it it exposes it all so that you can um, you know I can. Uh, uh, I can, I can, I can see every event that if you, if, if you've ever watched the log of all the events that fire on these things, I mean, it looks like a, like a, you know, a, a busy public web server log, you know, I mean, it's just going constantly. So all of these units are talking together all the time. And, um, you know, if you want to find out, uh, if you want to, if you want to hook one event, um, one signal and act on it. Uh, you can do it. And it's, it's uh, it, it really cool. That's what I was talking about when I, I said I made a mistake and I didn't put a switch or I should have put a switch. So um, the, uh, that's, one of the, that's one I double tap to just turn on one lights. If I turn it on once, it'll turn on lights that it's not supposed to turn on. So um, anyway, yeah, but I get your point. The, the, it isn't this, the last one I was showing you is not the easiest one. The other one, the first one that is kind of the funky looking screen, that does all that, that interrogates everything. You just enter in the device and tell it to auto, uh, click the button to auto discover and it figures out what kind of device it is and sets it up for you. Okay. The other, th the, the other thing that I that I it's always been a criteria for me is that I like it to be a standalone thing, uh, you know. So I don't need a I don't need a computer for it uh, unless I want to change something. So uh, the uh, I, I, I like the separate little devices that don't cost much, and I put them in the closet and then don't look at them unless I need to. <laughs> So then the, uh, you don't, the only time I need the computer is when I'm actually logging into it to do something. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna actually, I'll look up that thing, that one for the Mac. I, 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 I know there is one, I just haven't really, I didn't wanna do something that was OS specific like that, but. Uh, hey, if you wanna share your screen, I can pop it up or like I said, it's client server and I'm on a laptop. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll check, I'll check it out. That's, okay. That's, uh, I'll, I'll look at it probably this weekend or something and see what it's all about so that I, I get a good idea. But uh, thanks for letting me. What's the name of that again? Indigo. Indigo, that's right. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Um, yeah, they've been around since. I used them with, started using them back in 88 or 89 with X10 devices. So they've been around for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like that home seer company. They've been around about as long. Yeah. 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 You, say you've, you forgot to mention about X10 is if your microwave comes on, forget about it. <laughs> yeah. There's a, X10 has a lot of issues, but uh, the, you know, for some simple things, I still use them for things. Um, Actually, I have three set up in my living room and my dining room because I don't use them very often. Yeah, but, you know, I just never got around to changing them out. It's the last three I have. Yeah, the beauty, the I used of, thirty of them at Christmas time. <laughs> the, the beauty of X10 is that they're reasonably priced. All this wonderful stuff like Zigbee and and uh, Z-Wave that came out later on, you know, and Insteon, that stuff's all three, four times as expensive. It's kind of frustrating. It's almost like nobody has come back into the market again to try to challenge the, the incredible pricing of the X10 products, despite the fact they had some issues. I mean, they were the first in the seventies to do all this stuff. Yeah. But uh, nobody's really addressed that. They're still the low price leader. I kind of wish that uh, somebody would challenge them that way. I think with Insteon, the problem is uh, Smart Home is one who holds all the patents on it, and they're taking fully advantage of it on keeping everybody locked out, because you're not going to find very many Insteon devices that aren't made by Smart Home. Um, the other thing, though, about Smart Home, when you're, you're absolutely right about the pricing on them, but the one thing I have found out over the years is that just watch for their sales. It's Usually, you can get the stuff for at least 25 to 30% off. We just watch for you. Get on their mailing list and they'll send you sales stuff. And I usually don't buy them unless I, it's at least 25 to 30% off the list price. 
Does anybody remember uh, CBUS and the promise of CBUS in the mid 80s? I went to their conventions. They had a chipset called the Echelon chipset that was supposed to get integrated into all the houses. And it was a special bus for houses. And I learned to program the Echelon and wrote code for it. And, and it just kind of never materialized. And X10 kind of kept going and going and going. And you got a Z-Wave and Zigbee that was supposed to take over the world and become the new protocol. And they're still the VHS and Betamax, still duking it out. And I just sure would be nice if somebody, X10 was so ubiquitous and everybody was compatible with it. And there's third parties, you know, tried to copy it. And, you know, they got it into Radio Shack and it could do just about everything you wanted. The controller was pretty flushed out. It just seems like it's like we're we haven't gone very far since 1980. You know, it's the new stuff's great, but now you got ten different competing technologies that are all too expensive. Without, you know, other than Brian's, you know, find in this particular application, this open source application, there's 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 really never been uh, agreement amongst the vendors to create something that is truly u- ubiquitous. You know, I think that's what they're trying to do with this open source offering is address everything. And they've made the architecture extensible and open source so that, uh, um, you know, they, there's a lot of people with special interests that are writing plugins for it. And um, the uh, uh, I was actually I was looking there's something like 2000 plugins available for this already. And, um, you know, people like the guy that wrote the TiVo plugin. Um, he didn't ask TiVo, you know, TiVo's got an API that you have to discover kind of, and, and, uh, but he, he did it cause he has a TiVo, you know, and that's how these things end up and uh, he wanted something. So, um, uh, he wrote a, uh, a, a, a plugin for it and it actually works. And, uh, the, so I think that's where they're kind of going. I mean, you know, like, like uh, a lot of that open source stuff ends up becoming the de facto standard after a few years, you know, when it, when it, uh, you know, uh, matures. And, and this is the one I showed you was a version three of this. They've, it's been around for a while. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's just going to keep getting better. So, uh, but it, it's, what do you do in there, Ken? Oh, my Wait, oh, my video came on. Oops. I was, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm heat shrinking a, an extension cord that I accidentally severed with, or not severed, but uh, mutilated with my new weed whacker when I wasn't paying attention to what oh, I was yeah, doing. This, I was trying to... <laughs> this could have been a lot worse. Well, uh, what I was really talking about when I was talking about ubiquity and, and, and um, you know, having something for that's, that's compatible for everybody across the board. I was thinking more in terms of the protocol than I was the the application layer. I'm talk, thinking more of the yeah. hardware, you know, in the protocol, Zigbee versus Z-Wave versus X10 versus Insteon. I mean, you got so, and then you had that one that started with a W that got real popular two or three years ago, and then they declared bankruptcy. Um, and then you got TCP Lake with their own, and Bed Bath and Beyond had something with their own. I mean, just it's just gotten to be nuts. Um, I, I want to see a protocol that everyone will adopt that works across the board, and yeah, you know, I- you don't have to it's a bunch of different devices by different manufacturers. You know, I was really nervous when I put in my Insteon stuff because I know how this is, you know. And uh, but I, I mean, I put in about ten thousand dollars worth of stuff uh, all together, a lot and um, a lot of switches and and things. And I was making a big commitment, and some of it took some rewiring. You're not rewiring, but rewiring in the sense that I had to change how things were connected in the boxes. Um, And so, you know, I was worried, very worried that it wouldn't last, you know, that three years later, I'd be, they wouldn't, they'd be gone. And, you know, I'd be stuck with this stuff that wasn't supported. And, you know, so I took pictures, I made notes of everything, so I could put it back to its normal condition. And, and uh, I've been pleasantly surprised, at least with the Insteon, that they've stuck around and, and they, they appear to be doing well. The, the uh, equipment has fared better than I expected it to. 
and uh, the you know the it's it's been really reliable we don't even think about it well that's good to hear your story because i my old house um 20 years ago i had done the whole thing in x10 but it was a small house it was a thousand square feet i didn't have that you know the investment was hundreds of dollars and then when i moved into the new house which is 2500 square feet and counted 170 light switches it's like to buy that in Insteon, I was looking at Insteon and it was going to cost me thousands of dollars. And I literally, I never did it. I just never bit the bullet because I couldn't, I just thought, you know, it's just too much money, but I didn't want to do X10 because I knew it, there were better things on the horizon. And it, it's not a perfect protocol. It's a little frustrating, especially in a larger home. And so it's, it's great to hear that you had that success because that's kind of where I was, I was going to go. And I had the exact same fears you did, but I didn't, I decided I wasn't going to act on it for that very reason. So that's, that's great. That it's yeah, still I mean, I just it. thought if I was going to do it, I had to do it because, you know, if you wait around for everything to, to level out, you know, it'll never happen. You know, you'll never, you'll never do it. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Right? I, one of my issues wasn't just the cost of all the switches. I mean, to wire in 170 new switches, you know, it's hours and hours and hours of either your own time or an electrician's yeah. time. No, it kind of gets to the point where you kind of wish you could just start with a brand new house and do all the light switches become literally just um, contact closures that all go back to a control panel the way they did it in 1950. GE had one of those control panels with relays all over the place. And you had DC voltages that went out to your lights and the switches were just controls. That's all. I mean, that was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I don't know if you've seen one before. It's really cool. There'll be one closet in your house that's got this board that's, you know, six feet long and five feet tall filled with relays and all the switches come in on single pair twisted wires. And then all your lights, switch, all your lights go back out. And if you want to reconfigure it, it's, you know, it's not as brilliant as wi-fi or insteon stuff today but it was it was way ahead of its time and it's still a pretty cool way of doing things you know hey go ahead joe joe's Brad, hand. is the club going to have any field day participation doesn't look like it okay the uh but there was some talk about it but we don't really have anybody to kind of run things and get everything going so uh, there may be Joe. I don't know. Uh, there's still a possibility we may end up doing something up at uh, the uh, uh, Ellings Park, but uh, we don't know yet. The other problem is, is that to get permission to go do these things, there's people that are still holding out for the for the state to, you know, declare the uh, health emergency over, you know, and, oh, yeah. and uh, so. Uh, but at this point, I'm not counting on it. Okay, thank you. And 7-3 crew, I'm going to leave. Okay, Joe, thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night. Hey, Joe. Any other questions or comments? Hi, right, Joe. I was just thinking of the um, the field day. Maybe we could have a, you know, like in the um, a PR thing like we've done at the uh, marketplace before or something like that to demonstrate ham radio and, and have... Yeah. Uh, a field day like that. The uh, yeah, we might. I, we were talking about it at the last board meeting. What we could do. The problem is finding somebody who wants to to be in charge of it. Huh. If we can find somebody who wants to kind of run the field day event, then then that'd be great. But uh, we got to find somebody who wants to do that. Um, so if anybody wants to step up and volunteer to do something, well, we're all ears, you know, just let us know and we'll make it happen. But uh, uh, what ends up happening a lot of times is it, all, all the work falls on the same two or three people and, yep. and, and they don't want to do it one year and the whole thing falls apart. Yep. Yeah, well, my job is volunteer recruiting, so I, I totally hear you there. Yeah. <laughs> and I Brian, can't run it because I can't drive or set up antenna. So there you go. Okay. Another <laughs> that, That's a great possibility. We should think about that. Another option that a couple of people have brought up, um, might have been the Levi, I don't remember, um, was possibly 
uh, all of us participating from home since they're allowing that this year, I believe. And then um, as a group, we all of our, you know, we all put, put our names in the hat. And then as a group, we we do our make our contacts and everything. So it's more the contest part of it. Oh, you're not supposed to call it a contest. Sorry. This is the the that that part of it versus the the public relations part but you know we could uh, do that and submit all our logs together as one unified club so that's that's another possibility uh, did you volunteer to to uh get that all arranged i can't this year unfortunately we we got to move the store and things are starting to look a little bit imminent so i'm going to be completely wrapped up and uh, looking for some real estate unfortunately Okay. Well, if you hear anybody that wants to kind of, you know, run the show and get that stuff, kind of stuff organized, that'd be great. And we could all sure. do that. We got it. We just have a lot of other things going that are taking a lot of time and, and, uh, it's, just, it's, you know, the, the, you know, myself and a few other people, you know, we're, we're, we're working on, we're moving, uh, we're trying to, our network is half down right now. So that's an emergency that we got to address. And uh, the router doesn't, can the router doesn't seem to be uh, handing out DHCP addresses anymore. And it's like randomly disconnecting things. So, uh, and it's was set up very, it's very complicated, so that's uh, a project that's going to be sort of demanding immediate time so um you know but if anybody you know anybody wants to organize something like that just you know let me know we'll do whatever we can to support it and make sure that you have what you need Brian, is there any chance that that uh, router issue is is causing the link problem from yeah Oh no, I, no, I don't think so. But we, I mean, we'll find out sooner than we'll resolve the link problem. But I don't think that's it. Um, okay. I think I mean, the, we might proceed with the analog link no matter what. I mean, we're starting to buy parts for it. So. Yeah. No, I think that's a better way to do it anyway. But the um, no, what's happening is is your two devices just they mysteriously dropped off, and now I can't get into it. Eric was able to get into it through the mesh. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think he got in. The routing is different for that. The things that are on that are DHCP routed that are that are uh, those are the things that we're having problems with. And the the mesh has a a VLAN or something that it routes into the network, or that it uh, there's a VLAN route from the mesh to the to the uh, network and so I, I, I think that's why he was able to get in. I'm going to try it again tomorrow because uh, I'm going to try something else I thought of. But Where uh, is this, Brian? Pardon me? Oh, Where this is, is this? At the club station. Oh, down at the club station. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, we have a, a Ubiquity Edge router, a little tiny guy. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's doing a lot of hard work. And um yeah, I got rid of mine and I put in an ER4 and it uh -huh. solved all my problems. Did it? Yeah. And the difference is, you know, the difference is one is $49, the other is 129 But with the ER4, it's just, or maybe it's 199 but it's, but the ER4 just doesn't suffer from all the little, all the problems. Well, I put in a, uh, I already put in a, uh, it's a Intel based board running PFSense. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you're uh, just using that as a firewall then. The what? PF sense. The PF no, sense. No, use it's a full router. Okay. And uh, the the router firewall. I mean the the uh, but I'm, I've been moving things over to that. So um, but I couldn't. Uh, the Ubiquity board didn't have any way to like save the configuration or the ubiquity router uh i looked all over tried to figure out a way to, to download it or something so i had to take screenshots of everything you know and now i can't even get into it so um 
you know, hopefully well, SSH. Get... What, have you tried SSH into it? Uh, you know, apparently that's open. I didn't know it was open. Uh, uh, Eric said it was so. Yeah, I use SSH on mine, and I'm able to. And basically, I download. I always download the um, the config using that. Okay. So I SCP the config back to uh, the boot.config, um, mm -hmm. and I copy that in from mine. So, um, you know, maybe try and get a hold of me tomorrow if you if you're down at the station. We can if you have a question. All right. Yeah, I could try that. The uh, see if see if I can get in that way. Um, anyway, it's uh, we'll get it we'll get it figured out. The uh, it was just it's there's uh, three different uh, networks. They set it up. They, they, they I didn't set it up. Somebody else set it up, and they, they uh, it's probably overcomplicated for what we need to do. But uh, everything was going pretty good. But we were able to get to all our devices and I set everything up. I set up a control panel. So it was all one click and you're in and all of that. And, and uh, the, uh, then all of a sudden things started happening the other night. And now we're kind of, you know, we had one machine that was uh, uh, dynamically assigned and it went off this morning apparently sometime that something would host for somebody else. And uh, so I went over and moved that over to the new one. The, the, uh, but I, I've, I'm using PFSense routers for work and home now. So yeah. I'm real happy with them. They work pretty, pretty good. And plus the boards that they're on, the ones I have at work and home are uh, I-5s. And this is a J-19, I think. And the one down at the club station, that's a lot more power than those other ones have. So hopefully that'll, that'll be a good thing. So we'll see. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate it, Tom. All right. Anything else for before we go home? <laughs> I always like doing that. Say, everybody drive careful. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Marina gets to drive home tonight. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't been drinking or anything, have you? <laughs> no, but I do miss, I miss, I do miss the cookies. <laughs> oh yeah yeah you know has anybody talked to daryl not lately i did hear him on the radio recently you know advertising the the uh whatever that is the regular program that we get from arrl or oh you heard daryl on the radio yeah because uh his club uh mailings have been coming back as uh his account is inactive hmm and we did the uh, that on Wednesday. Oh, okay. All right. I haven't, I haven't. So he's, he's fine. I, then I'm not going to worry about it. Um, but every time we send out a mailing, it comes back. Uh, that is, he, uh, it says his account's inactive. It's Autotron at Juno, but maybe Juno's inactive. They've been dead for years. I don't know even know who's managing that email. Brian, he's been talking about getting a new email address for a couple of years now. Um, oh, he was maybe. so fed up with Juno, so maybe he finally did it. Maybe he did. Okay. Yeah, he should. Uh, if anybody talks to him on the radio, have him let us know what his new e email address is so we can change it. So that we get stuff to him. So that's why he's not here at the meeting tonight. He's usually here. So uh, I was worried. Yeah. Yeah. Ken, are you going anywhere near the mountain anytime soon? I'd like to. I'm just kind of. I'm really busy at work. I actually talked to Cecil at the Papa System today, and he's going to have some guys up there on Sunday. Um, and then I was thinking about maybe heading up and trying to do something at the same time, but I decided otherwise, just based on my workload. So no, I don't. I don't have any Im imminent plans. Okay. Yeah, I've got to. I've got to get that duplexer going because I'm running out of space and time there. Okay, nope. All right. Well, I guess we'll call it a night. Right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Good night. Bye, right, folks. We'll do it all again next month. We're thinking maybe uh, July we may be able to try and go back to in person meetings with cookies, Marina. <laughs> that would be <laughs> Yeah, with cookies. There <laughs> nice you go. Nice to see people. Yeah. 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 
Well, yeah, I'll we have can... to. I'll have to phone. I'll have to phone that one in though, from Gnome. Oh, geez. Oh, right. Well, we still may have a Zoom component to our meetings. I'm trying to figure out exactly. I'm, how I'm not sure there's enough bandwidth in Gnome to do that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> is there is there a cell signal up there? Um, not much of one, I'm told. I hope the like Board of Trade Bar is still there. I spent yeah. a bunch of time in Gnome. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I will be bringing the KX3 with me in a loop. So we're going to play with that. We have a, we have a call from up there. We've got a station call for our uh, club up in up in Alaska. So uh, AL seven Q. So we'll be on the air probably from up there. Yep. Well, have a good time. Thanks. All right. Well, everybody have a good weekend. Then uh, we'll be down at the club station tomorrow. So if you're out and about, come by. I want to <laughs> see you there, Jerry. But uh, we'll be thinking about you. Are the people are are the people who are indoors at the club station all vaccinated? Yep, except one guy, and he had it. He's he's uh, but he doesn't come inside to tell you the truth. He stands at the door, and he's not there very long. But uh, everybody else has been vaccinated. Yes. Yeah. Either infected or injected, right? Infected or injected. Yeah, one guy, a new member, he's been by a couple times. And he, I asked him if he'd been vaccinated, and he said, no, he's, he's got the antibodies now. He's, he was, he got tested or something, and they actually told him don't, don't get the injection because he had as good or better protection than, than, than the. Yep. <clears throat> this isn't necessarily better protection, but it's, he's got antibodies. Yeah. Other than that, everybody's got their cards. Matter of fact, Levi even wore his card. Oh my God. You know, that's a good idea. I've got a couple of extra lanyards. I can put my uh, my vaccination card on one of them. That'd be cool. Yeah. You can walk around and they'll still make you wear a mask. Uh, I, I carry it anyway. Yeah. Not up here, they don't. Not nope. in Arizona? No. We've been, we've been running around just doing what we want to do for a while. Yep. Yes. So, so the question so the question is, how big of a spike are you guys having? I don't think I've heard anything None. about Arizona having None. an issue at all. None. Nothing. I so. think Florida and Texas now have gone a couple days without a death. So the, uh, and they, they, I don't think Florida ever had a mask mandate. I mean, Texas stopped theirs a couple months ago. Well, see, Costco's turned that off. Uh, Trader Joe's turned it off. Yeah, Joe's, uh, Even here, Trader Joe's, um, you don't have to wear a mask at Trader Joe's. And yeah, I talked to a friend of mine. He, he walked in there without a mask and he said everybody else had one on. But they yep. told him he didn't have to have it. Yep. He asked. He thought he was, you know, had to go back out to his car and get his mask. And they said, no, we're not telling anybody. So. All the restaurants are open. They're 100% capacity. The staff aren't wearing masks. The customers, maybe one out of 10, are wearing a mask. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, that's I think we've only got 40%. Is it 40 or 60 in California, uh, in Santa Barbara County that are vaccinated? It's, I think I uh, heard 50% tonight on the news. 60 in, 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 in Santa Barbara County? 50%, yeah. Okay, well, I, I, I thought it was lower than that, but they figure with 60% vaccinated, uh, they probably have another, uh, just under 10% that have had it, I looked at, according to the numbers I looked at the other day. So that brings you to 70, which means, which is the magic number or the, the, the number where they estimate that, that at that point, uh, there would be sufficient herd immunity that the, that the uh, case, number of cases would, would gradually decline down to zero because the virus can't find anybody before it, uh, before it, it burns itself out. And, and again, you know, the virus that is present in a given victim 
needs to pass it along in order to continue to propagate. And if it can't find anybody before it dies, and at 70%, it's less likely to find somebody than it is to die. So, so that's what, at that point, the, the case rate begins to decline. Um, anyhow, so it, we're getting close to it. And uh, if it, I, I came down and left my mask on because I didn't know the status of everybody in the room didn't want to ask because there were just so many people. <laughs> But it was a very, uh, crowded, very crowded room. Up here, everybody puts their mask policy on their doors. So you, you walk in, when you're walking in the in the building, they'll say, ask if, if the sign's missing, you don't wear a mask. And if there's one there, then you put one on. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm uh, really old and I got lung disease and diabetes. So I'm not comfortable being in an indoor space with uh, people who are not vaccinated. And, and not masked. I, well, I, as far as I know, everybody uh, that's been coming to the club station is all vaccinated. So, I mean, I think I've asked everybody if they were. The, uh, well, I think if, if, I, if I come down tomorrow, I might, you know, shout out, is anybody here not vaccinated? Because that, if you ask if everybody is, it's kind of hard to tell. You know, <laughs> not everybody says yes. There's a sort of general hubbub about it. But uh, but if you ask it the other way, that would reveal it if there were a couple of people who were, who were not vaccinated. So. All right. Well, you got to be careful. Yep. Good night. Well, I'm just not giving hugs to anybody that's not vaccinated. Is what I'm, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the family, you know. Yep, no kisses here either. <laughs> well, that's that's. I'm glad to hear that. I'm not vaccinated, uh, Doc. <laughs> no hugs for you. No. No hugs for me, please. <laughs> All right, we'll see all you guys later. Thanks. Good presentation. Hit the red button and let it do its thing here and archive our meeting. <laughs>